Wolf Kahn is beloved and respected as one of the most important painters working in America today. Born in Germany, Wolf emigrated to the United States by way of England in 1940. After graduating from the High School of Music and Art in New York City, he spent time in the Navy. And under the GI Bill, he studied with the well-known teacher and abstract expressionist Hans Hoffmann, eventually becoming Hoffmann's studio assistant. After receiving his baccalaureate degree from the University of Chicago in just one year, Wolf joined with other former Hoffman students to establish the Hansa, a cooperative gallery where he had his first one-man show. He's received a Fulbright scholarship, a Guggenheim fellowship, and an award in art from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He's a member of the National Academy of Design, as well as the Academy of Arts and Letters. And believe me, I had to edit down this section of, of his biography. Wolf has created landscape paintings all around the world, but in the summer and fall, he's to be found in West Brattleboro, where he and his wife, Emily Mason, have lived on a hillside farm since 1968. Wolf regularly exhibits at galleries and museums across North America, and his work is held in collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Hirshhorn Museum, and the Los Angeles County Museum, to name a few. It occurred to me recently, I was in the gift shop actually at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe, where I saw the familiar WolfCon postcards and calendars for sale. It occurred to me that the prevailing visual impressions that so many people around the world must have of Southern Vermont are the result of Wolf's tireless work over these past 42 years depicting our barns and fields and trees and hillsides. And they're not generalized depictions, they're of actual places. When you drive around with Wolf, it seems like he knows every landowner, because at one time or another, he sat outside on their property and painted their landscape. Well, aren't we lucky to have had our humble countryside presented to the wider world through the brush strokes and pastels of Wolf Kahn? And aren't we lucky to be here with him tonight? Would you please welcome Wolf Kahn? this thing all organized in such a way that it's um, uh, very, very formal. But then I decided it's really more fun to tell stories. <laughs> <coughs> so I'm going to start with a story. And the story is a contrast of two teachers, One of uh, both of them famous artists. One teacher that I studied with is Stuart Davis. Now, Stuart Davis taught a class in the evening uh, once a week at the New School in New York. And um, he's to be found in the company of a couple of people that were buddies of his with whom he could talk about jazz and um, um, baseball. Those were the two passions that he had. He had no passion for, for teaching at all. And when, when it came time to close the, the class, he said, memorably, he said, um, all right, children, let's close the magic portals. We've generated enough art atmosphere for one evening. <laughs> <coughs> My other teacher was Hans Hoffman, and of course, he, a greater contrast between Hoffman and Davis could hardly be imagined as teachers, although as painters, they, they're both of, of great consequence. Um, Hoffman s said a lot of memorable things, but one of the things he said uh, to, to the class is, um, it'll take you years after you're out of school that you understand most of the things I'm telling you. And then he also said, um, um, he says, uh, well, he, he mentioned uh, a, a carousel in Oak Bluffs on Martha's Vineyard. And as this carousel goes around, there's a place up high where there's rings hanging. And if, if you were quick and um, and agile, you could get one of those rings. 
and the ring would get you another ride on the carousel. Um, so Hoffman said, says, if you really listen to what I say, you'll get nothing but rings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the contrast between my two most, most important teachers. Um, now, <clears throat> I have to make an apology, which is that whatever I say is bound to be generational um, compromised generationally compromised um, because I noticed that uh, I'm very pleased that there's quite a few people here of my generation although most of them younger than I am thank God for them and um, and um, uh, and these people who uh, the younger people maybe excuse and say things, uh, say that uh, when I say things that they don't agree with or don't understand, they, they say, well, he's just an old fart. He's gonna, say, <laughs> he's, he's gonna say these things because he's of that generation. But I must say, the generation that I belong to and the generation even more strongly before, the abstract expressionist generation, the School of New York, so-called, I think was the last moment in recent art history when art was being created without any cynicism at all. It was being created to, um, to um, be free of entertainment value and, uh, and, and to be philosophically significant because it was based on previous art, it was based on um, surrealism, it was based on, on, on things where artists had, had over the centuries considered um, uh, these issues. Ever since the time of Giotto and Duccio, you know, they've, they've considered the issue of how, how to fill a space in such a way that every element in that space had a relevance to every other element, which is very different from um, what my favorite two, I have two favorite hates, and I will be ha very happy to have this audience so, and subject them to, to my, uh, my uh, favorite prejudices. One of them is Jeff Koons, who, uh, who makes um, uh, kitsch art, you know, and it, he, it's, it's meant to be that. It's meant to be that he wants to make contact with uh, all layers of society including the low, lower, uh, w uh, less well-educated ones. So he had one exhibition in which he had nothing but pornographic photographs. And um, of course he attracted immense numbers of people with that. <laughs> you know, people who had much less interest in, in, in art than they had in sex, which I think they can all be excused for. <laughs> um, then an, another, another painter who's also very, very well known and still alive is a, a painter named uh, Richter, German painter. And he tried very hard to eliminate all sentiment out of art, but have it all depend entirely on brush strokes. You know, it's the brush strokes that make the art rather than the feeling behind it. So that he, for example, um, copied whole pages out of newspaper with, uh, with, in oil paint. You know, he had a, a machine that projected the newspaper onto, the, um, onto a, a large canvas. And then he painted carefully around every letter and carefully uh, copied the photograph. And, um, and then he was very smart. At the same time, you know, these people who, who do these hateful things um, are also very intelligent because at that time they had the Bader Meinhof gang in Germany, you know, who uh, killed people and set fires and so forth. And they were finally they were finally caught and imprisoned. And they had photographs of the um, Bader Meinhof gang in, in the newspapers in jail. So he very carefully copied those photographs in oil paint. And ever since then, he's been known as a politically very, very involved
involved person <laughs> because he did this, you know. And he did it entirely cynically and, and just, just to show that, uh, uh, you know, how easily people are led astray. So these are two of the people uh, who, whose work I really dis despair about. And unfortunately, they're much more famous than I am. <laughs> <coughs> Upstairs, people are having a conversation. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Now let's get to the um, subject matter of this lecture. Can art be taught? Now, uh, people have come up to me and, and asked me, what, what's the answer? And, of course, I tell them because I want a large audience. I'm terribly pleased <laughs> to see you all here, you know. I, I, I say, well, you know, to tell you the answer would be like giving you the end of a detective novel. You know, you're supposed to be at this lecture to find out the answer. But to be actually honest with you, I don't know the answer. You know, I don't know the answer. I just know some examples where art has been in some way unsuccessfully taught. In most instances, it's unsuccessfully taught, you know. But then it's taught unsuccessfully, mostly to hobbyists and, and, and Sunday painters and people who don't want to, you know, set their whole life uh, 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 as artists. Um, so so it's, it's an instance like I was teaching at uh, the Vermont Studio Center, which is way upstate somewhere, nice place. I'm a trustee of it, which means it cost me a lot of money. Um, <laughs> Um, and um, uh, there's a guy there who just retired from being the CEO of a large company. And um, he asked me after I'd seen his work, I mean, he knew I'd, I'd seen his work, he says, is there any chance for me to be an artist? So I looked up, you know, I scratched my head, I looked up, fortunately my tennis pro was there. Larry Bales, you might know, know him because he taught here uh, for a while. And so I said, well, you know, I go to teach, to, to, to learn to play tennis. Now, I'm never going to be John McEnroe, but on the other hand, I do get a little better e each time that I work, and that gives me great satisfaction. And you can ask Larry, who knows that I'm not at all talented as a tennis player, but he, he, uh, you can ask him whether that's true and whether he enjoys teaching me. And so Larry obediently nodded his head. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, and I was able to tell this, this retired uh, CEO, he says, that's the attitude you should have about your art because you're never going to be Cezanne. You're, you're, you're not going to be Matisse, but you might get better if you keep assiduously at your work. So what there really is, there's two kinds of teaching. There's the teaching for amateurs and, and, um, and there's the teaching for, for people who, have, who feel they have a calling, you know. And to, have, to, 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 to be an artist is almost like, like having to be a monk or a clergyman or some, some kind. You have to have a calling. You have to have something that gets you beyond all the dissatisfactions of, of not knowing what you're doing, of, 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 of striving after a kind of control which is really harmful for you and finding out over a period of time how harmful it is, you know, and, uh, and, and all these things. And then once you get out of art school, of course, a terrible moment arrives because nobody cares less about anybody than the public cares about a uh, an art student fresh out of art school, you know. <laughs> you're, you're, you're broke, you're, 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 you um, uh, have no real skills, uh, and, and um, you know, you're, you're, and, and if anybody comes around to, to buy a picture from you, they think they're, they're um, uh, performing an act of charity, <laughs> which, of course, which, of course, is what they are performing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, um, if, if one is teaching, if one is teaching people who, who, who feel that they have to spend a lifetime in art, 
It's a very heavy responsibility. And unfortunately, most teachers don't make that distinction. You know, I mean, I think that there's not a, a, a field that's more filled with, 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 with people who uh, don't know what they're really harm, that they're really uh, uh, doing uh, unemployables that they're providing to, to, into the society than art teachers. You know. Of course, to be an art teacher for kids is wonderful because, because there you, you, you allow uh, um, children to, who, who maybe don't have, have great, great loving love for learning, but you still have them drawing in art class, and, 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 and they love going there. And it's, in some, some instances, uh, the best part of their school week to go to art class. Um, fortunately for them, that passes very quickly. Um, uh, they get involved in the teenage culture. And there's not a, a, a worse uh, part of life than, than, than the life that you have to traverse the teenage culture because it's such a disaster area. You know? um, in, fact, uh, in fact, I used to teach um, uh, in, in a professional art school. I taught, taught young kids, you know, college age kids. Um, and um, at the same time, there was the Vietnam War and there was my daughter who, uh, who was rebelling and um, um, I just got turned off, totally off young, young people for a while. You know? <laughs> and and, and I, 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 stopped, I stopped teaching them, you know, so, so that the latter part of, of, of my teaching career is entirely devoted to, to adults. Now, adults uh, have their own problems, you know. <laughs> the, problem, the main problem for adults is that they're, they, 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 they're self-critical. You know, they never think they're good enough. And, and, and you, have to, you have to teach adults that, that to, to, be, uh, to, to be doing art, especially if, if, if you don't have to depend on a living from it, is, is to, have to, to have a good time. And if you're constantly asking each brush stroke that you're making, am I a good artist, you know? Uh, uh, um, then, then you're spoiling the fun. I mean, I, I think art making should be a game and a dance and, and, an, and an enjoyment. And if it's not, I think you should quit. You know, if it's not. I'm allowed to, to, to uh, be uh, uh, self-critical and to have a lousy time. Uh, <laughs> because because um, I found out one very funny thing, which is that when you don't like a painting and it gives you a lot of trouble and it makes you uh, uh, actually work a lot harder than you want to, the painting usually turns out to be one of your best works. You know? So suffering and art go together hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend um, uh, who just died, Lester Johnson, very fine artist, and um, he said, he says, if a painting doesn't give him trouble, he's angry at it because it isn't making him go through his paces. <laughs> so, uh, you know, every now and then, like for example, this summer, I, I, I was at a stage early in the summer where I hated to go down to my studio because I, I was facing all these half-started half things that weren't going anywhere, you know. And uh, it took, took about a month or two before I had enough paint on the canvas that I actually enjoyed working on them. You know? And now I still have some things that, that are still giving me trouble, so I feel that I'm still on the side of virtue. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Now let me tell you, let me tell you, um, I've already told you the main thing about Stuart Davis's teaching. Let me tell you about the two best teachers that I know, Hans Hoffman and myself. <laughs> uh, Hoffman School was located in New York, in Greenwich Village, and he had a row of easels and a model. 
model was a nude model that was sitting up, uh, up front in one pose all week long. And Hoffman would go around and criticize each, each picture from the exact same place where the art, uh, art student was working. And then he'd take his own piece of chalk and go right into it, you know. He, he, and then every now and then he'd take a pair of scissors because, because he thought he had the idea that there had to be a shift. Uh, so he took one piece, piece of, of paper and moved it one way, took, took another piece of paper, moved it the other, and then say, see the shift, you know? <laughs> and um, uh, then uh, if, if he was criticizing paintings, however, then he at least asked the student, can, can I take the brush? You know, and he took the brush and, and with a few, few deft strokes, made the thing come a little more to life than it was uh, before he, before he, he worked on it. Um, he, also, he also made it seem that art was a very difficult enterprise, very difficult. And um, I, I, learned, I learned that from him as a teacher too because I was terribly proud when a class where against my better judgment at Cooper Union where I taught uh, um, as an adjunct, um, there was a class which had <laughs> like eight very talented kids. You know, Cooper Union is a, is a non-tuition um, uh, school. You have to pass all sorts of exams and get recommendations and so forth. And um, then, um, um, so, so theoretically, theoretically you got uh, the, the, the cream of the crop of art students, you know. But actually the funny thing is that every group Every class that you have is made up of the same proportion. You've got four hot shots, <laughs> 15 mediocrities, and 10 people that shouldn't be there. You know? And, and, and it's, it's invariable. It's invariable. No matter, no matter what happens. At Yale Art School, where they, you know, which, which is the most difficult art school to get into, certainly at Hoffman's, um, that was the case. Um, so anyhow, um, Hoffman would ask permission, you know, to, to, to take the brush and, and improve these, these paintings. Now, how did he improve them? What was, what was his pri primary uh, criterion? Well, he, he went on the basis of what, uh, what's called in, in, in the uh, professional language of, of my sub- uh, subspecies here, um, it's called formalism. Formalism means that you, your painting is, an ener is a field of energy bounded by the four sides, you know, or round if you're painting a round painting. And, um, and you have to be sure that there isn't any part of that field of energy where the energy flags or where you come to a stop or where, where it, it no longer the part no longer relates to the whole and takes over. And, um, um, you know, that's like, like, for example, Bach in music uh, was a formalist, you know. Incidentally, one reason that there's not as many hobbyists in music as there is in painting it's because in music you actually have to know something to start. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, you have to know how to read notes, you have <laughs> harmony, theory, you know. Um, and uh, in, in art, you can, you can start anywhere and do anything, and um, uh, maybe something comes up, but more likely, all that happens is the normal kind of Sunday art, which is descriptive totally descriptive, you know, where somebody is trying to paint the church steeple surrounded by maple trees and, and so forth. So um, um, to go back to my own teaching again, uh, what I sometimes do with a, with, with a group is I, s I send them out into the landscape and I say to them, st start your painting for the first half hour painting nothing but things to which you cannot give a name. In other words, no church steeples, no maple trees, you know. And I, 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 I make the, um, 
I make the uh, um, analogy with portraiture. And I say in portraiture, um, most people start with the nose and the eyes, you know, and then, then the mouth. But what you really should start with is the shape of the head, you know, because that, that's what, what pri primarily uh, gives the, um, the, the, the characteristic of, 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 of that person's face, is the shape of the head. I, w I went to see a sculptor, Emily, what was his name, Where, with Fairfield Porter's portrait? Um, his pa he was the grandson of a famous architect. White? Oh, yes, that's right. Robert White, sculptor, good sculptor. And he had made a portrait of, of, of a colleague of ours named Fairfield Porter. And there was something wrong with that portrait. So um, I told him, take a meat cleaver and cut off that part of, of, of his par face and that part of his face because his face is narrow and it goes this way rather than this way. <laughs> Which he did. <laughs> Which he did. And it immediately looked like Fairfield Porter. <laughs> so... Um, uh, anyway, this is a good example of what uh, Cocteau said. It says, he said, uh, 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 apropos of not a fair few porters, portrait, but for other things, he said, one should always go further than one should go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, now back to Hoffman. Um, Hoffman said all kinds of things that we didn't understand. <laughs> like he said about Mondrian, he said, move a line one centimeter and the whole thing collapses into decoration. <laughs> and Mondrian himself, of course, uh, said, he says, plastic composition is a matter of establishing unequal but equivalent opposition. So I scratched my head over that one for, for quite, in fact, I'm still scratching my head over it, you know. But every now and then in my own painting, I say, gee, that's an unequal and an equivalent opposition. Maybe I'm doing it right, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, these things are, then he also said um, there was an exhibition of a very difficult abstract expressionist named Clifford Still. And he says, you must all go see that show at the Whitney Museum. He um, says, you won't understand it until you've been painting for five years. But you should see it so, so that you know what, it, what, what, what you can reach. You know, he was always, always talking about reaching. And he was always trying to get his students into trouble. And of course, like I say, you know, now I've gotten the habit of being in trouble from Hoffman School, and I'm no longer feeling that I have to destroy something. I just just have to push harder, you know, to get past that point. And I have all sorts of ways of of of, of getting past those points, like maybe uh, taking one color and going over everything like this, you know, and then picking it out again in different ways, you know, blotting. I mean, there's all sorts of things you can do that, that make it uh, possible to get over difficult uh, uh, points. The main thing is to avoid, in my case, to avoid seamless mending, you know, which is where you take a tiny brush and you start fussing around with little things. No, I think art is primarily, at least mine, about energy. You know, and if you start once once you start getting fussy and and stiff, the energy goes out the window. So you're best off not even as soon as you start losing energy in the painting, turn it against the wall. Maybe a couple of days later, it'll it'll gain its energy back the way wine ages ages in the cask without you having to do anything about it. You know. All right. Um, so this is what Hoffman uh, uh, does, and he um, um, just in general.
to be in contact with a um, with a great man, which I thought Hoffman was. You know, the whole idea of great men, of course, in America is is poo pooed because it's very undemocratic and it's it's elitist and so forth. But there are people that are beyond other people. Let's face it. And Hans Hoffman was born no, known more about knowing more about life than most people live uh, who, who who live a long life will ever learn. You know, and. Um, uh, so, so he's like one of the three great men that, that, that I've, I've had contact with in my life. You want to know the other two? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Maya Shapiro, art historian, who had a house actually in, in uh, Londonderry here in Vermont, in a summer house. And then the other is um, a, a Jewish a rabbi who was the rector of the Jewish Theological Seminary and of the Hebrew University. His name was uh, Saul Lieberman, and I'm sure nobody here has ever heard of him. Anybody here heard of Saul Lieberman? No, of course not. <laughs> That's right. Well, we're, we're in an essentially non-Jewish area here. Uh, so, so uh, but Saul Lieberman uh, was the foremost uh, uh, student of the Talmud, and he was a great uh, promoter of the Jewish religion. So, for example, he, he said, um, uh, you know, I once came to him and uh, uh, said something about Christianity. You know, it, uh, I mean, the idea of turning the other cheek, isn't that a lovely idea? And Lieberman says, it says in the Talmud, he who turns the other cheek should be stricken on that cheek. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Um, um, He's, uh, the idea of, uh, of, of, of loving your neighbor uh, uh, as yourself, he said that in the Talmud it says that's very unrealistic. Nobody's going to love their neighbor the way they love themselves. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and things like that. And then about Christianity, he says, um, he said, this will offend people, but that's all right. Um, uh, about Christianity, he said, um, he said, beware of Judaism softened and made easy, such as Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> he also said, he also said something else. He was trying to convert me into Judaism. Of course, I'm Jewish. <laughs> uh, uh, he said that, um, um, uh, oh gosh, I was going to tell you, and it's so good, and I forgot it. Uh, don't ever get to be 83 years old because, <laughs> because your mind starts really playing tricks on you. Um, uh, well, a next lecture, I'll, I'll bring that one up. Um, okay, now we've talked about uh, uh, the Hoffman School and I'm very eager to have you ask further questions about what make, made that school so great. Um, now I talk about my own teaching. Now, I, I actually, I stopped teaching in 1977 at Cooper Union um, because the um, the dean and I didn't get along, and I threatened to fire the dean. <laughs> <laughs> and and he actually believed me. He was, <laughs> Because I said to him, you know, I'm not going to go to the students. I play poker with the trustees, you know, and I, I uh, so so pack your bag because you're not going to be dean very long, you know. And uh, and he believed me. And finally, after ten minutes of me threatening him and him backing up from having fired me, he said, Well, what can we do to keep you here? So I said, Well, I want a letter from you that I'll be rehired for a year, we shouldn't see each other because I can't stand the sight of you. Uh, uh, but, but after a year, I want to be rehired at a higher uh, uh, um, rank and salary. And I got that letter from him, you know, astonishing. Yeah. You know, there's an English, uh, no, there's a, a uh, Scandinavian author, uh, playwright named Strindberg, who, who keeps writing about changes in, in, in power.
between where the underling becomes more powerful than, than the boss and so forth. Um, and um, well, the people here who are interested in theater know of, all about those plays. And uh, uh, I thought I thought I was I was carrying out a real Strindbergian drama there myself. <laughs> you know. But anyway, he uh, just just uh, as an aside, the dean got back at me because when I came back as an associate professor rather than an assistant professor, as I came back as an associate with I think 200 bucks a week more. Um, he gave me a class of all the people who wanted to have independent study. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, most of them, you know, weren't, weren't really up to it, to worthy of being on their own. So after about three months of, of, of that, I said to Dean Zadig, I said, you win, I quit. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, my own teaching. I, um, I try very hard to keep from teaching um, descriptive skills, you know, which is most art teaching is about, you know, how to paint foliage, how, how to make perspective uh, uh, correct, and uh, um, you know how 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 to 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 uh, uh, paint a nipple, how to paint a shoulder, how to paint an eyebrow, and and all that stuff. In fact, when I first had art lessons at the age of ten, I was taught by my art teacher then how to paint the fuzz on peaches, which which uh, which I learned how to do quite well. Except now I have no use for that <laughs> for that piece of knowledge at all. So, um, but. Um, um, and then, of course, after that, after I finished teaching the, these young, younger people, and I felt very relieved because they were all going to be, they were all going to be artists. They were hoping to be artists. And um, so I went again, three years later, I went to the gra graduation show that they had. And uh, to my great relief, I had, I, uh, at that class, I had to give eight A's goes much against me. I, I, I think out of 16, I had to give eight A's because they were all very talented kids, very hard working. But to my great relief, six of those eights have become photographers. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, then I started teaching a class called Using Pastels at the National Academy of Design in New York. And um, there we have a, um, a small studio, well, much about, about a quarter the size of this, um, and 30 people uh, uh, can be squeezed into that class. You know. And of course, as they work, this cloud of, of, of uh, um, uh, toxic metal, <laughs> metal uh, salts hovers in the air, and then there's always some some student comes up to me and says, well, Mr. Khan, aren't, uh, isn't breathing this stuff poisonous? So I say to them, I say, there's no gl more glorious cause of death than pastel poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> After which, of course, they breathe it in deep, deep breaths. <laughs> Well, anyway, but we don't we don't use fixative in that room. They have to go out outside into the street to use fixative. Um, but what I do there is I start them out, I st and and the class is made up. I who first come first serve. There, so there's people who've never held a pastel in their hands before, and then there's college professors who 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 are in this class too because they've heard about it or they've read about it and so forth. So it's no, there's no hierarchy in this class at all. And I, I, I asked them to be, as a beginning, to, uh, to take a piece of paper and, and draw um, a, a strip across it, you know, two lines, and then to go from black to white with a pastel in such a way that you can't see any where one 
one tone stops and the other one starts, you know. So you go from uh, deepest dark to lightest light <coughs> without making any stops. And of course, very hard. Even I can't do it. <laughs> and uh, the next thing after that is I have them make um, um, a thing called the parade. Now the parade, I start out by saying, it starts out with um, uh, police on motorbikes. And then there's a Boy Scout troop. And then there's a um, Coast Guard uh, attachment of, with a band and holding flags. And then there's a limousine for the press. And then there's a limousine for the mayor. And then there's a limousine that holds the emperor of Abyssinia. <laughs> and then there's, there, there's another one that holds his family and that holds lower uh, uh, um, um, officials from the city. And then there's another detachment of police. And then there's a sanitation trucks to clean up the mess. <laughs> he says, all right, now I want you to take, take that uh, strip that you've made, make divisions, equal divisions on that strip and make a picture using only abstract colors, no description at all, make a, of that parade. You know, and of course they again scratch, scratch their head. He says, well, what I'm really teaching you is crescendo and decrescendo, you know, going up to a climax and then going back down to, to, to and of course everybody, when they begin, they, 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 they start with a black. And then they're surprised that, that uh, you know, after that, they can't get any darks in there because they, they've already, s s they've shot their wad, you know. <laughs> and um, um, so, so then finally, after, after an hour of, 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 of working very hard and spreading immense numbers of, of, of toxic chemicals in the air, they, um, they finally get it so that they have the two center things be really strong colors and then sort of, you know, um, paste, paste the colors down to where, where they're practically non-existent. And that, that, that then I, and then I never bring in, when I teach, I never bring in outside sources. I never bring in a Matisse book or anything like that. But I, I use, whenever somebody is doing something right, I hold that up and I say, see this? This is the way you should start beginning to do it. And of course, then everybody wants me to hold up their picture <laughs> as, a, as an example of, of virtue, you know, <laughs> which, which I uh, often do. Um, then they also come, then they also come with the idea that, uh, since I use bright colors sometimes, um, that I'm a colorist, you know, and that, that idea of being a colorist upsets me, you know, because um, what does it mean? You know, it doesn't mean anything. Um, so I, I tell them to, to make a picture in which they celebrate the color gray. Well, again, scratching of heads, you know, and, and, and great, great. Uh, um, uh, and then uh, it comes time for lunch. And I say, OK, now I want you to make a sandwich. An abstract sandwich in which you have nothing but layers of color, but they have to be such that you feel like uh, eating them. That they're, 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 you know, that you've got a, a variety of texture, you've got a variety of, of freshness, um, you've got 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 some edge to it, and the bread could be, uh, you know, pumpernickel or it could be uh, Jewish rye. It could, but but you have to be able to see entirely just by the color that you're using that this is something that's edible. And um, by the time they're done with that, they're really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next day, the next day we, we do something which is a lot of fun. We divide the page into a tic-tac-toe board where you have a square in the middle and uh, eight squares around the edges. And I say, all right, now your center square, your center square is a, um, 
color that you really think is the best you can do. And the, the surrounding that color, you put in other colors that really set off the beauty of that central color. So you see again, there's, 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 there's no expertise involved. There's no, uh, you know, somebody who's just beginning and somebody who's been there for, for a long time has the same chance. It's a matter of your, your, your um, visual imagination and your fantasy, what happens there. And of course, then we go around at the end of this, when they have it all done, then I give everybody a, a piece of paper and they, um, they have to put their piece of paper on the one they like the best of the ones that, that the 30 people have done. And uh, after two or three uh, ballots like that, I give a prize. And, um, you know, a chocolate bar or a, cal a, cal a calendar or a uh, uh, old catalog of mine, something, you know. <laughs> but everybody sort of feels that they've, they've really been in a uh, competitive situation which of course the art situation is not because the, um, the uh, what does it say uh, in the Bible? It says, the mansion of our Lord hath many houses. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, one, one person's art and another person's art to, to, to try to, to weigh them against each other is, is foolishness. Although, there again, there are exceptions. How many people here have been in the Pitti Palace in Florence? Not, not all that many. I urge you all to go. It's, it's the best museum in Florence because it's got so many bad pictures in it. <laughs> and the reason that that's, that the reason that that's so, so worthwhile it's because every now and then in the middle of one of those pictures you see something that's quite wonderful. You know, they're all from the Renaissance. All those pictures are from, from the Renaissance. They're Madonnas and Christ being flagellated and all, all, all this, you know, one after the other in three rows, I think, you know, all the way up to the ceiling. And in between there, there's like a Raphael and uh, uh, um, what other good Renaissance painters are there? Um, uh, Michelangelo. You know, I mean, but they're all, all, all s s sparse in between all, all, all the other stuff. So you really begin to, to see that there's, it, it's the same in a museum as it is, like in a good museum like that, as it is in a class. There's, there's four hot shots and there's 15 <laughs> mediocrities and then there's 10. <laughs> Ten paintings that shouldn't be there. <laughs> okay, now let's see. I'm heading toward the end, but I have to find out what the end is. <laughs> oh yes. So what I want, what I want this lecture to um, kind of leave you with, is the idea that the making of art is not the making of a product, and it's not the, uh, the, the expression of the zeitgeist or, 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 or a trend or, or uh, uh, autobiography of the artist or something, but it's, it's an example of somebody who's following a high calling, a high calling. Um, there's, um, let's see, I have a very good quote, but now I can't find it. Um, oh, it's over here. Um, oh, yes. And then I also want you to understand one other thing, which is that art, while celebrating the visual sense, is also a celebration of particulars, of the unique instance, of every, of, of, of every, every picture describes a, 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 a set of particulars. And um, it's not, it's, it, because of that, it's free from convention. And it, because convention deals with generalities. Huh? So I want to quote what T.S. Eliot said about the mind of Henry James. 
You all know who Henry James is, right? This is a very educated audience. Huh? Anybody here who doesn't know who Henry James was? <laughs> well, you wouldn't let me, let me know that anyway. It's, a, it's <laughs> shame. <laughs> but anyway, T.S. Eliot said about Henry James, um, says, his mind was so fine that no idea could enter into it. <laughs> So I, I, uh, I think, you know, that, that as long as you don't let ideas to enter into your, into your mind, um, I think you're in good shape. Emily, my wife, who's also a teacher, uh, she teaches at Hunter College in New York. She, she tries to tell her students, get the mind out of the way. And she has all sorts of ways of trying to uh, accomplish that. She has them paint with their non-dominant hand. She has them paint in the dark. She has them paint upside down. You know, if the model's sitting this way, they have to have her going this way. Um, all kinds of devices it's where, where you're no longer able to draw upon what you already know. Because an artist, if he paints for people things that they already know completely, he's not doing his job. So if you have any questions, if, if uh, you're... you're um, uh, uh, have a disagreement with you, I'd be very happy to entertain that after it gets sufficient applause. Overdoing it. <laughs> okay, now uh, can you put the lights on so I can see uh, who, who I'm uh, uh, talking with? <laughs> Overhead lights. Anybody know this theater? Yeah. I think the house lights have come out. Can you stick? Can, is it too bright? Right, shining yeah. right at you. Well, I, I'll just stand here. I, if I stand here, I, yeah, no, that's better. That's better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, the question I have is, um, if you were to teach young children, let's say, really young children, let's say, seven, eight, nine-year-old children in watercolor painting, how might you approach that? But before you answer, I just want to say that what I've observed teaching these children, without knowing maybe as much as I should about teaching them. What I've noticed is that, um, which is very interesting to me, the children who seem to be the most um, able academically. Can you all hear? No. no. Oh, okay, I'll be louder. Could you stand up then? No, I'll, I'll, I'll just be louder and sit. Okay. The, the children who seem to be the most able academically or the most intellectual, who are sometimes very good at drawing forms, they aren't, they somehow don't come out as naturally with beautiful colors when they paint. And the children who seem to be um, more naive and not so um, sharp yet intellectually, academically, they just seem to have this natural way of having beautiful colors appear. And it's always, always the same. The same ones have the beautiful colors, and the other ones seem to be having more exactness of form but don't have this natural sense for color. Every once in a while, there's somebody has both, but not so much. And so um, it's just something I noticed which I find interesting. And, and when I do the colors, uh, I do only I do watercolor painting. And I do it on wet paper. But um, so I just wanted to know if you had any suggestions about how you might approach working with such young children in painting, in particular. Well, the, the thing about young children is they all start off with a terrible uh, liability, which is that they've had coloring books. Oh. You know, and coloring books, coloring books makes a lie out of nature because it puts outlines around everything. And there are no outlines. Show me an outline. I haven't seen an outline as long uh, in the last 60 years, you know. Um, and yet, and yet that's, that's what we're all brought up on. We're all brought up on outlines. And of course, I think one of the things about those more privileged children uh, intellectually, is they probably got more coloring books than the other <laughs> <laughs> So, so tell, tell the parents next time you meet them, no coloring books, you know. Um, but of course, kids, kids are wonderful. They, they do have 
I mean, by the age of nine, they're already, you know, a little bit in danger. But up, up to the age of 11, I would say, you can get good work out of kids. And then the teenage culture takes over, and after that, forget it, you know. Then they have to go through that, and uh, the peer group uh, values start taking over. In my case, I was very lucky because I knew how to make caricatures that, made, that looked like the people. And um, so in order to gain um, um, popularity, like before the teacher came in into the classroom, I'd make a caricature of that teacher in, on the blackboard. You know? <laughs> and then the kids would all be very excited to see how, what the teacher's reaction would be. You know? And of course, the teacher was, was at a great disadvantage because I went to the High School of Music and Art in New York. You know? <laughs> where to be, uh, to, to, to be able to get a resemblance uh, was considered to be quite something. You know. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, for your kids, I think provide them with, with a lot of materials and then also interesting project. There's a, um, an art teacher here who, um, who, who, who has very wonderful ideas. Andy, where are you? Andy, what do you have your kids doing? Uh, I give them the materials and get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's that's really that's only part of it. Yeah. Well, um, I show them real art and and have them make make projects about things they know about they know about from real life. Such as. As um, as um, as their own house or self portraits. Sometimes we go out in the woods with, you know, and use materials we find there. Can you do that in your school? Mm, not no so woods. Easy. No, there are woods. <laughs> Self portraits? Well, at this age, the age I'm teaching, I wouldn't, I think I wouldn't go there yet. Well, how about port a picture of a friend or of their family? I mean, you know, the art of the the art of children has 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 had a great and I think often very beneficial effect upon upon mature artists. Um, uh, for example, Paul Klee used use it as a uh, and and then also another another very interesting source for real art is the art of the insane. You know, because whenever there's a picture made by an insane person, you never ask. Why did the person do that picture? Whereas most of the pictures you see elsewhere, that uh, you can't find an answer to that question. You know, why did the artist paint that picture? Why did the amateur paint that picture? You know, you have a feeling. Well, they did it in order to fulfill some sort of requirement. You know, or some 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 oblig interior obligation to be skillful or to show that they know how to do something. You know. And of course, with the art of the insane and the art of children, you don't don't have any of that, and that makes makes it very enjoyable to look at that art. You know. Yes. Uh, well, I was um, going to ask you about why it is that when you and I walk in the woods, we see things so different. But I wanted to. Uh, I know my father had asked that same question, and I didn't quite give an answer then, but I wanted to come to something else to ask you about, which is the role of emotion in your pastels. I was uh, struck that you, there's so much exuberance to so much of your art, and yet uh, you recall that when you visited uh, me in Croatia, there was a terrible tragedy, and you did some pastels, and they, they captured the sense of the tragedy. Was that just accident, or is that something that that well, emerged. it was the bad weather caused that plane to crash into the mountain. That also made your garden look very, uh, very uh, sour and, 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 and dim, you know. But it could have been sparkling, too. No, not really. Not really, no. The role of emotion. Well, <clears throat> I tell you, there's some things that you better not even think about and not even be conscious of. And 
you know, if you're trying to consciously um, uh, be, uh, explore your emotions, most of the time what comes out is garbage. Uh, because emotion is something that's either there or it's not there, you know. In the same way, talent, if you're, if, 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 if you're talented, it's either there or it's not there. But there's plenty of untalented people who are quite good artists, you know. They just have a special gift for something, you know, but it's not this thing that, that, that uh, like I, for example, had by being able to make these caricatures of the teachers, you know. I mean, that's real talent. And at the same time, it doesn't mean very much, you know. It's, it's something that every uh, uh, newspaper has somebody who knows how to do that on the editorial page. Um, so, so that um, um, it's, it's important to be unconscious about a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. To be uh, like, you, you have to, there's a, 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 wonderful, um, a wonderful phrase that Yeats has in, in, in this poem, the, um, the celebration of innocence. It's a phrase that uh, occurs in, in, in the poem um, uh, where, where, where also he has another very good phrase that's where he says, the best lack all conviction while the worst are filled with passionate intensity. You know, that's something we should all listen to right now, you know. It's not nothing, it, it, it isn't happening just now, but it, it happens a lot. That the best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity, you know. And as far as, as far as, like I'm, I'm always worried about myself, you know. When, when I look at my own work, I say, it's too talented. It's, it's, too, it's, it's too charming. You know, it's too nice. I wish I, wish I was nastier, you know. Like, I have I had a good friend, Joan, Joan Mitchell, who, who was a very angry woman. And she managed to put that anger at the service of her art. And her art was very strong, had a lot of energy to it, because she's constantly you know, <laughs> going like this, you know. Uh, and I, I wish I wasn't so mild. I think I'm much too mild to be an artist, and yet here I am, you know. Questions? Yes. Uh, you mentioned Raphael, who came out of a small town in Italy and then became a student of a painter who we've probably forgotten. <clears throat> Have you ever had a hotshot student who Perugino. Have you ever been, have you Thank ever you. I'm glad I remembered that. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me seem like such a, you know, art historically sophisticated person. Really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had a hotshot student who might, in some respect, be able to teach you something? <clears throat> Yeah, well, every student teaches you something, often what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever had anybody come out of any of my classes that became really famous. And, um, um, but then, you know, how many people are there that are really famous? In each generation, there's like maybe 60 worldwide, you know. So I didn't get one of those six, you know? Is that my fault? No, I don't blame myself for that. <laughs> yes? I'm curious, you said um, that you tell your students in the very beginning to uh, go out in the landscape and paint and, and, and um, depict paint? things that don't have a name. Yes. So what do they do? Well, <laughs> like, how about the space underneath a tree? And then is it, is it color that they use, or is it...? They can use whatever they want. But they, the, the main thing is uh, no eyes and no nose, and, uh, you know. But if they want to start with the space behind their ear, that's a good place, you know. I mean, in other words, you go out looking for something that you haven't seen before, or that you haven't uh, drawn before, you know. Like I, I went to, a, I was invited to be a, a um, visiting critic at uh, 
Uh, I don't remember where anymore. But anyway, there was one student there who, every time she came to a part of the body that she didn't know, she drew like an angel, like for kneecaps. She was terrific on kneecaps. <laughs> folded hands. She was terrific on folded hands. She was wonderful on shoulders. But when it came to breasts and uh, uh, thighs and things, she was on automatic pilot, you know. And I made her aware of that. And um, uh, I think that helped her, you know. In other words, if you don't know something, you're probably better off than if you do. Hmm? I, know, I know you don't believe that, but I, 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 kind, of, I kind of think that. Yes, any, anybody on? Yes. Yeah, well, you refer to city palace. Wait a minute, can you do it louder? Yeah. You reference city palace in Florence. To what extent do great art museums teach art? Well, they make a mistake because they only show great art, you know. So you can't ever tell what the difference is between great art and ordinary art. And, and uh, that's why I find the Pity Palace so useful. You know? <laughs> I mean, I really, I really enjoy going there in order to make discoveries. While you go to the Uffizi in Florence, there's no discoveries you can make. Everybody's discovered everything there, you know. And, and it's uh, all you can say, oh, yes, there's, there's the Botticelli of the birth of Venus. Oh, yes, here is, uh, uh, you know, or in the Louvre, here's the Mona Lisa and so forth. And you just get reinforced in, in all these conventional judgments that you've already, uh, that have been forced upon you from childhood on. You know, and and you're much better off making l looking. I mean, like, I think I think one of the things that good teaching does it teaches you to look. It te it teaches seeing, seeing. That that I didn't mention that in my lecture, but now this is an addendum. Learn seeing, <laughs> seeing. Okay. Um, where are we? Oh. Uh, we we have time for a couple. A couple more questions. questions. <coughs> Sir? You mentioned uh, the vagaries of being 83. Of whom? Of being 83 years old. Yes. The vagaries. Has that in any way affected how you paint or what you paint? Uh, well, I, uh, I tell you what, I also have an, another problem, which I hope none of you have. I have a macular degeneration. And that's why I have to have my, uh, you know, Hubble telescope in my hand. <laughs> uh, um, and the macular, I wrote an article, which, which I haven't had the courage yet to, 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 to show to anybody to publish, but it's called The Hidden Advantages of Eye Disease for Artists. <laughs> um, it, you, can't be, you can't be fussy anymore. You can't be precise. And you have to sort of um, look at the whole thing all the time rather than specific instances in order to carry the work forward, which you should be doing all the time anyway, but most of the time you're not. You know, you, you, you fixate on one place that's giving you trouble and you forgot, forget everything else. Well, a lot of people are looking at my work now and saying I'm doing the best work that I've done in my life. I feel terrible because it means that if I go blind, I'll be a genius. <laughs> okay, last question. Yeah, you talked about uh, uh, seeing art as a higher calling. And I'm sure that some of the students you've seen have come to you with that understanding, but have you seen students develop that sense of higher calling through the studies that they made? Well, I'm, I'm a good example of that. I had no idea that art was as important in the culture as it was, and, and that you had to strip yourself of so much of, 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 of prejudice and convention before I met Hoffman. Old Hoffman taught, 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 taught his students you know, uh, this idea of, of, of art as a higher, higher calling. And I'm sure most art, art schools don't, uh, don't really uh, promulgate that, you know. 
And it's probably very good because it, it would create even more unemployables than there are already. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This has oh, been okay. absolutely Good audience. Good audience. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So we'll make